our virtual office hours for our Youth Apprenticeship Works series. Um, this is an opportunity for us to come together as stakeholders, as practitioners um, in, a, in an office hour format. So imagining we were all coming together <clears throat> around a big table, maybe there are some danishes, there's some coffee involved, um, and we're just able to kind of sit and talk and ask um, each other and ask some of our experts that are coming in to help share information with us about um, information and issues that are pertinent to registered youth apprenticeship. Um, so today we invited um, Matt McKinney um, and Steve Lutton from the Institute for American Apprenticeship um, to talk to us about the benefits of registering your youth apprenticeship program. Um, and again, we welcome and ask for um, input and insight. And please prepare your questions as you're as you're listening to Steve and Matt's brief discussion um, about this work. Um, but when we're ready, you can go ahead and take yourself off mute and ask any questions, or just raise your hand or put it in the chat box. Matt and Steve, can I pass it to you? Yes, you yeah. can. Um, so the presentation was designed to, to be interactive. Uh, so people can feel free to jump in whenever they choose. There'll be moments where we specifically ask you to, to participate, but the hope is this is more of a, of a dialogue and, and forum versus us talking at everyone um, because A, I can talk a lot and get lost in that sometimes, and that's not good for anyone. Um, but B, uh, as we uh, start to talk about some of these things too, people have had individual and specific challenges and we wanna make sure that we account for those and potentially answer any questions based on our experiences. So that said, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so happy National Apprenticeship Week, right? Important week for apprenticeship um, for seven years or so. I think we've been celebrating Apprenticeship Week, uh, recognizes all of the hard work that this group and many people across the country do, and most importantly, it gives some recognition to apprentices that have earned those credentials and, and are pursuing a career uh, as a result of an apprenticeship. Next slide, please. So uh, we're here to talk about the benefits of youth registered apprenticeship, but I think I wanted to start with the fact that there are, is a lot of data out there that talks about the advantage of registered apprenticeship. So there are lots of benefits and actually, the USDOL has done a fair amount of research related to return on investment. So things like, and they get these get these stats get thrown around all the time, and they're important to our work. You know, for every dollar invested in apprenticeship, approximately a dollar fifty comes back. Uh, there are much higher retention rates for apprentice uh, that are enrolled in quality workforce development programs, aligned with their apprenticeship. Um, so there's higher wages associated with apprentice and Again, these are all things that are benefits, important, all aligned with the work that we're doing. So we're hopefully gonna to talk today about how we can apply these things to youth registered apprenticeship. Next slide, please. So it's interesting to present uh, on youth registered apprenticeship when actually we're presenting with a group of very seasoned experts that have all done wonderful work and research in this space. So if after this conversation, you want more information, I felt that it was necessary to point towards the document that was recently published uh, talking about youth apprenticeship in action. Uh, it's on JFF, JFF's website. It's a wonderful resource uh, and it's it's worth a read. It, it, it does a nice job summarizing this important work and the potential benefits. So again, it's, this is a good takeaway and I would recommend that anybody follow up and take a look at it. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're gonna do a 30 second drill and I actually have my little friend, the bell with me here, but based on the technology with my headset that noise cancels, you often can't hear it when I ring it. So I may have to verbally sort of say that it's ringing, but next slide, please. Um, so what I'd like everybody to do in the next 30 seconds or so is in the chat, or if you wanna share out loud, um, I wanna hear about some of the barriers you've experienced to youth apprenticeship because apprenticeship is amazing, right? There's all sorts of benefits, but there are specific challenges or nuances associated with youth registered apprenticeship. So I would love to hear about some of the challenges in the chat and there are bonus points for the people that are most creative. So why don't we start right now? Can people hear the bell? I think people can hear it. All right. 
What are potential barriers? Transportation, that's a terrific one, Jonathan. Child care, lack of parent support, insurance, all good ones. Regarding regulations of youth on site, that's another great one. High schools that can't, won't get creative with their scheduling, there's another one. Child labor laws, is another terrific one. Employees don't understand what young people's potential are, right? Confusing around what it really means or apprenticeship really means. That's one on confusion. Right. All right. So our 30 seconds is up. Bell ring. So if we were to put a problem statement together as to sort of what we are trying to accomplish today, A, we're going to talk about the importance of apprenticeship, but overcoming people's stigma and the potential barriers associated with it, right? Our problem statement would look something like apprenticeship is a beneficial program, but to implement it, we need to overcome transportation, childcare, lack of parent support, insurance, high schools that are not flexible enough, child labor laws, employers that don't understand the potential in young people, confusion around what it really means, and employers that don't feel like they have time to mentor. Right, so that's pretty simple and easy to overcome, right? Um, in our experience, it has not been, but when you get it right and when you can register a youth apprenticeship program, the reward in seeing what happens for the youth and actually the benefits to the employers and the other stakeholders involved is great. It's incredible. It's amazing, actually. Um, so. We have to do the good work to try to overcome these barriers. Next slide, please. So registered apprenticeship in the youth space doesn't, it's, it's not as simple as filling out documentation for the US Department of Labor, right? It has to be grown over time. The components of a youth registered apprenticeship are youth and family with a specific focus on family. My experience in this space is if you don't include the family in the conversation related to the youth or individual that's interested, you will not get full buy-in and you will not be successful. Um, employers are an important part of any apprenticeship program, schools and educators. Obviously, these many of these young people are still in school, so that's a critical component. There's the credentials and the, the credit. Those are benefits associated with youth apprenticeship programs. And then ultimately the registration with the DOL that will tie this together and really help. And what we're trying to achieve across the bottom is alignment with all these partners, agreement on what they're offering and who they're serving, access, right? Access is incredibly important, uh, especially in today's world, uh, access to these opportunities, uh, from an equity standpoint has been highlighted and, and really needs to be pushed forward. Uh, and then ultimately the accountability and registration helps with that accountability piece, but actually we need to understand that all of the partners have some level of accountability in this to ensure success. Next slide, please. So, what do youth and their families need to know about youth registered apprenticeship and why is it critical and important to them? So if we think about this and people can unmute and talk or they can type in the chat if they want, these are the vital questions that in my experience, working directly with or in this continuum as an intermediary or working as a represent, representative of several of the components of an apprenticeship, that we've had to answer. Um, so for youth and family, oftentimes they wanna know what is an apprenticeship? How will this impact their graduation, right? So children enrolled in youth apprenticeship, they need to graduate high school. Can an apprentice still pursue college? There's a stigma and oftentimes an understanding that it's one or the other, and that's not the case at all. If you are successful with a youth apprenticeship program, oftentimes it can mean both a career and college education. Will my child be safe? That came up in the conversation. Does an apprentice get paid wages? Uh, how are employers involved in the education, right? So 
youth and family have all these questions because when you think about education and employment, they don't often think of the two merged or blended. Um, these are all challenges that you can overcome, but we'll talk about this in later slides. The registration process or registering your youth apprenticeship actually helps as sort of glue that holds all this together and actually gives it a tangible outcome that oftentimes can get people on board to participate. Uh, were there any other questions that people would ask or thoughts they had around youth and family and the, the information that we'd have to provide them? Matt, I would add one one thought also is, is that that link between um, youth and family, the, the internal discussion that needs to happen can also be pretty heavily influenced by the conversations that go on inside of the school system. So oftentimes um, counselors, guidance counselors, uh, school administrators can um, contribute to that conversation and even distribute information for uh, the programs that are under development or being considered. Um, and I, it often is a way to garnish support um, for the program for the apprentice and for the family, um, not to reuse Matt's point, but it is kind of the glue. Sometimes that, that conversation that's uh, between the school system and the family is just as important as between the parent and the, and the, um, the apprentice. Uh, Christy brings up a good point in the chat too, related to the um, non-traditional apprenticeships or, or, or apprenticeships out, outside of the traditional trades. Those offer students incredible opportunities in IT, healthcare, and other spaces that you typically don't think about apprenticeship in and offer many people access to those roles that they might not otherwise have. So again, those conversations in education are critical. And as we start to work down the continuum towards registered apprenticeship, that credential gives all these things sort of the the sort of the real world feel or take or the takeaway that they earn um, that can help get people involved. Um, some other comments in the chat. Um, a lot of counselors still think apprenticeship means no further education and no terminal degree. Such a misconception that's incredibly true. Uh, I developed a youth apprenticeship uh, here in New Hampshire while I was working for an organization called Hypotherm. Um, and a principal in a school in a meeting room looked at me and I was appreciative of the fact that he was bold enough to ask the question, but in front of a room asked a very direct question and said, you need to convince me before I approve this program that you're not trying to turn all my high school kids into machine operators. Like that's exactly what he was concerned with was that there was some dead end intent sort of selfishly by the employer to just slot youth into these programs just to serve their own purposes. Uh, the individual's name is Ian. Uh, he's my son's principal now. It's actually really quite funny, the interaction between he and I. Um, but he learned a lot about the fact that a machine operation career path can equal a lot more than what you see in the movies. And also youth apprenticeship is incredibly important and, and has a lot of runway, especially for individuals that may not think that they're gonna take the traditional college pathway Although we had engineering students take that program and do incredibly well and yet it get accepted at school as a result. All right, next slide, please. So the next player in the continuum, right? We have the individual and when it comes to a registered apprenticeship, you always need an employer, right? There has to be a job. So what do employers need to know about youth registered apprenticeship? So, Again, similar questions. How does this benefit our business? Is it legal to have youth in our facility? Do youth apprentice earn a salary? Can the work, can, or can they work during the school day? Are we responsible for the apprentice education? So these are things that have to be worked through. Um, but one of the benefits of registered apprenticeship is if you have a registered youth apprenticeship, some of these questions get answered, right? So there's exceptions with uh, child labor laws related to registered apprenticeship, right? There are ages that apprentice can be in workplaces or environments younger than they would have been otherwise because they're enrolled in a high quality program and mentorship tied to an apprenticeship ensures that they're gonna have oversight and that they're safe. Um, 
But employers typically, uh, and it, this came up before, have challenges with youth being concerned about whether or not they're ready to be in the workplace or whether or not they're mature enough or may have challenges. And we've had some of those experiences, both as an employer and working with programs. Sometimes we have situations that we have to deal with behavioral issues or some of those challenges. But I would say 75 to 80% of the time, we have no issues. That, that students are incredibly excited and engaged to be there. Um, they value the experience. And actually, employers learn a lot and value the experience as well. Um, so again, employers, really, typically, it's about safety. It's about whether or not people can be there. How do they participate in the education? And that is something that you know, we oftentimes with schools, leverage the extending extended learning opportunity or the ELOs here in New Hampshire based on the way um, schools interact with employers and can allow students to leave. Um, honestly, the first youth cohort that we leveraged was an ELO that was for 20 students. Instead of it being an individual, it was a cohort of people that were coming to Hypertherm to participate in an ELO slash apprenticeship or youth apprenticeship. Um, any questions or thoughts here? I, I would just add, Matt, under the vital questions, oftentimes the other thing that we we face when we're working with a youth program is, can I do this over the summer? Do I have to do it during the school year? Can I have um, participants, you know, come after school instead of during school? And I would just, you know, the, the apprenticeship model has such flexibility in it anyway, that really is, um, all of those types of questions that I just mentioned are easily answered in that, yes, any or all of the above are possible in the apprenticeship space. Um, it's just, it's, it's a matter of design and structuring the program around what that particular employer needs and um, perhaps the school system that they're working with that um, may or may not allow um, students to leave during the school day, for example, and then you'd come up with an alternative to that. Um, so, one of the thoughtful questions in the chat was, how do we include disengaged youth? And there are a lot of programs that, that will help support disengaged youth and enroll them in some of these programs. Uh, and oftentimes they're eligible as a result of the fact that these are taking place at employers during a lot of times. We work with a program in California um, where students that had entered into the criminal justice system uh, were able to try to work and then take their education or, or leverage this, um, take the time to get their GED off hours. So they were, they were still engaged in a, a you know, a, a work-based learning program and able to get their education at the same time through an alternative pathway. Uh, I think there's some work to be done in this space for sure related to youth apprenticeship, uh, but there are ways to engage disengaged youth uh, that aren't necessarily participating in the traditional school experience. So it's a terrific question and definitely a space where we need to do some work. We've also been encouraging um, employers to use the ban the box um, process in scheduling interviews. So um, by not asking them, the, the apprentices or the, the applicants um, to disclose information um, before they're um, interviewed, it allows you to kind of reach a broader set of individuals who may have background issues, may have um, may have left school early and not gone back to school. Um, but by allowing everybody the equal opportunity to that interview, that's really one of the first steps in ensuring that you're um, providing that that uh, opportunity equitably. Right. Um, can we jump to the next slide, please? We, we can, but Matt, can I actually just add something to the employer question? Yes. I, I do think that there is this misconceptions that employers have that they just don't have time for this. Like, I don't have time to train somebody. And, and the point I always make, you're going to train someone anyway. Like, you don't get to hire someone new and then not ever train them. Like, this is all part and parcel of the work that you do as an employer. So, I think kind of dispelling some of the myths about the role that an employer might play or in vis-a-vis -vis the apprenticeship and how this structured 
program can actually help to alleviate some of the, those concerns and questions, I think can be a really good way to get to an employer differently. Yeah, and I think they employers undervalue how much individuals that work for them appreciate sharing their skills and experience. So anytime that we brought apprentice into an employer, you get these amazing stories about the experience that the apprentice had. But what's fascinating is you get as many amazing stories about the mentor and the individual that got to work with somebody and share their trade or skill. Um, and, you know, it, it, it increases engagement. Like it changes the dynamic of somebody's work experience in a positive way. Um, I like uh, Jonathan's thoughts, perfection is the enemy of good. That's sort of a mantra of mine, right? And if perfection was a mantra of mine, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> so uh, we, we're gonna move on to schools and educators just for the sake of time. But again, educators as it relates to youth registered apprenticeship, Again, it's it's about how does the education occur? How do they apply credits or credentials? But this is a critical component and can be a real advantage to youth registered apprenticeship is that there's the opportunity for apprentice to be dual enrolled, meaning they can be earning high school and college credits at the same time. And um, this is a benefit to anyone, but it's incredibly beneficial to those that maybe never thought they would enroll in college or hadn't really thought about what a career looks like uh, post-graduation from high school. Uh, again, this is along the lines of access and opportunity. Um, one of the challenges here is often, how do you pay for the, the credits, right? So oftentimes, at least community colleges and high schools will have some level of agreement in place that will help either reduce costs or divert them. But ideally, you enter into a situation where those credits can be paid for. And one of the ways that you can do that is if these programs are registered, they're eligible for some of these supports that oftentimes can help an individual pay for these college credits, which again is a game changer. It was said in an earlier chat um, that you should talk about the fact that this reduces college debt. Well, this is one of the ways that it directly reduces college debt for an individual. And then once you transition to full-time employment out of high school, oftentimes organizations now have sponsored degree programs that take a variety of forms, but that is also a lever mechanism that an individual can earn a college degree while working and avoiding the debt that's often associated with earning that degree. Uh, are there questions here? Thoughts? This is a key component. Next slide, please. So credentials, right? Um, how do we ensure that education occurs again? How are colleges engaged in the process? How many credits are awarded? Are there potential academic certificates or degrees? And then how is the employer involved? That's the other thing that's always interesting about this conversation is the employer becomes an interesting component because much of the education and or the sort of lab type experience can happen at the employer. Um, and again, this is a partnership that you have to ensure that uh, when you're talking about the on the job learning related to an apprenticeship and credentials or credits associated with work experience, um, that somebody is there to help these two entities or partners understand the nuances associated with some of this work, because that's ultimately what apprenticeship and registered apprenticeship is in the youth space is it's a partnership, right? It's, it's several organizations coming together to try to do what's best for all of the stakeholders. Um, and everybody's got different needs, but again, the employer is, is, is always one of the nuances or interesting pieces in the credential and credit space when you're working with the colleges, um, because, Sometimes you have subject matter experts from the employer that are acting in the role as instructor or, edu or delivering education or working with the education provider um, to ensure continuity of the education and the work experience. Um, next slide, please. So ultimately, the goal here is that youth and families employers, educators, and then colleges 
community colleges, other education partners. What do they need to know? So this is when we get down to all of the really, you know, sort of interesting questions like, how do I register? Who needs to be involved? Who takes the lead? Who's responsible for the registered apprentice? And how does this help or ultimately help the student and youth? So until this point, all of those other things along the continuum can happen whether a a program is registered or not. Now, some of them can be more difficult. Finding funding for things can be difficult, but all of that stuff can be done and has been done in the past prior to registered apprenticeship. So why register, right? Why is it important to register? Um, it's important because it aligns and holds the whole system sort of accountable. It also makes it consistent and scalable. Right, I think that's one of the important things to think about is apprenticeship becomes scalable when it's registered. It also accesses supports, um, but it's difficult to do. Like it's incredibly difficult to build a youth registered apprenticeship. Any program that you see out there that has some track record of success, you should do your research, look into it and be incredibly proud of it. And what's fascinating is probably most of the people on this call were probably engaged or involved in it one way or the other, because they are incredibly difficult to build and, and sustain. So if we can go to the next slide, one of the key points that I hope I've made in this presentation is that registration of an apprenticeship program has benefits. It helps hold this whole continuum together. It brings everybody together as a partner, but it doesn't happen just as a result of the registration process. Intermediary support along the bottom of that slide is the compass and glue that holds youth apprenticeship together. And ultimately it likely cannot exist without it. Uh, JFF plays an incredible role in this space. Um, I've had the pleasure of being able to work in the youth apprenticeship space on behalf of JFF and before I was involved. And these experiences are incredibly rewarding and important. They're important to employers for pipeline for future talent. Education providers and colleges should be building and thinking about building programs around this infrastructure because it is the way of the future for some of this new talent, especially in non-traditional occupations. Uh, and there is more support now for registered apprenticeship likely than there ever has been in my lifetime from the US DOL at state levels and across the country. So this is a movement that's important to get youth engaged in and intermediaries play a key role in that and likely will always have to, right? So you can't do this without help. Right? There's, there, there's no one individual that can sort of navigate this entire system all on their own. Um, and you know the the intermediary is the guide uh, that 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 provides the support here. Steve, did you want to add anything? I I would just say that you know, to to Matt's point, it's also it's it's about project managing this in some ways, uh, being a guide, but it's also about managing all of the interactions um, and kind of the timing of what needs to happen and lining up the right people at the right time uh, to see this through. So, uh, Tricia wrote in the chat, employers also need to know that they're the ones that will hire these apprentices so they'll be able to choose who they feel is a good fit. That's right. So employers need to be engaged in the entire process because they do make some level of selection because in apprenticeship, registered apprenticeship, these are employees, right? These are people that you're bringing on. Um, so next couple of slides, I've got some personas or some examples of what this looks like. So why don't we jump to the next slide? So what does youth registered apprenticeship at Lint look like? So an individual who is currently 22 years of age was 17 when they enrolled in a youth apprenticeship program, currently have a manufacturing line lead occupation or role, that's their job, but their education, they have a BS in finance. When they started, English was a second language. They didn't have access to college based on their socioeconomic status. They needed sustainable income upon graduating high school, and they had a desire to start a career versus a job. So this individual wanted something that they knew that they could build upon. What the process looks like is Lint has a youth summer program. It's a registered apprenticeship for the machine operator role, the entry level role in their organization. 
This individual went through that youth apprenticeship program, graduated high school, did their uh, OJL during the summer, on the job learning during the summer, um, and ultimately got hired. Uh, once they completed the machine operator apprenticeship program, they enrolled in the line lead apprenticeship, registered apprenticeship program while they were working full time. Completed that. Once they hit the one year threshold and into their second year, they also enrolled at the same time in their degree program at Lint. Lint has worked with their local colleges and some actually some national educators and aligned credit with the education and training that they're providing in their apprenticeship program so the apprentice gets a head start but this individual has completed their bachelor's degree in finance and is currently doing rotations in the finance department and when an opening comes open they'll likely have an opportunity to take that job uh, this is an individual that has no college debt has been with the organization for several years at this point um, and is celebrated as a success story as it ties to youth registered apprenticeship. So this is an example of how this is both good for Lint, this is good for this individual, this is good for our community, um, and an opportunity for someone to really pursue a career. Next slide, please. So another example is of youth registered apprenticeship. This is a little different model, but this is ESEP's Early Care and Education Pathways to Success. This is an individual, an individual that is 17 when they're enrolled, uh, 19 currently, occupation currently is an associate teacher, uh, and their education is an associate's degree um, in early education. That in business should have been changed. I apologize for that. Um, while in high school, the student enrolled in a pre-apprenticeship program. So this is leveraging the pre-apprenticeship model because they were dual enrolled for the educational credits, but currently not working. They worked for a childcare center um, during the summer uh, and got some on the job training. Uh, after they graduated, they enrolled in their apprenticeship at the childcare facility and continued in college, uh, getting credit for prior experience as a result of their pre-apprenticeship ultimately culminating with an associate's degree and a program completion and a job in a child care center. Again, similar needs, completely different occupation. English is a second language. They didn't have access to college based on socioeconomic challenges, had a desire to start a career in the high school, so was looking actively for a role or a job in high school uh, and needed sustainable income while pursuing their education. Uh, so again, another wonderful example of how these youth apprenticeships in a variety of models, right? So these can be looked at in a variety of ways. This is an example where pre-apprenticeship is leveraged, leveraged, can benefit somebody and start a career. Next slide, please. So 30 second drill again, my bell's back out. Um, next slide. So. Type into the chat the benefits of a youth registered apprenticeship. So what, what is beneficial as a result of what we've sort of talked about and gone over today related to registering a youth apprenticeship? I feel like this group could have gotten this right before the presentation. So quality standards, learning that is connected to real world skills, career pathways, a path from high school to post-secondary lives, establishing standards for all to access. That's a terrific ad or example, stronger connections between businesses and education. Transactional relationships become transformational systems. Well put, Jonathan, well put. Um, next slide, please little college debt. So ultimately working together, we overcome the barriers to youth registered apprenticeship. Um, ultimately, um, it is a really good thing for everybody, right? It's not easy to do. These things are not easy to coordinate. There's lots of stakeholders. There's lots of relationships that need to be built. Um, 
There's lots of very specific things in every situation that have to be overcome. But when we get it right, it, it makes an incredible impact um, that creates access for people to have opportunities, careers, uh, wonderful livelihoods that they would not have otherwise had. Um, so that said, I, I, that's really all we had. And, and now it's sort of open for discussion or questions. And we can answer them specific to our experiences with youth apprenticeship, or we can talk about questions potentially have or experiences that you've had. Matt and Steve, I have an initial question to kind of get the juices flowing. Um, sure. One of the things I'm curious about, if you can go back to the young man that was employed through Lint, um, and and even the young woman that was employed as part of the the ESEPS program, the the early care education pathway to success. Um, how did do you have a sense as to how that conversation started in their school? I, I think I like your your the way that you kind of do the the small leaf all the way to the big tree, kind of like how it starts with students and families and moves all the way to the registered youth apprenticeship. How did that young man even find out about this, or how was he introduced to this as an option? Was that something he pursued, or was that something that was brought to him? Yeah, so the, I, that's a, so as it relates to lit, that's an interesting question um, because you know JFF helped with that. <laughs> um, but uh, ultimately, Lint had a program, uh, a summer program, but they, and they also had a registered apprenticeship program, and they wanted to explore what a youth registered apprenticeship program might look like. Could they engage with young students that were interested in a career at Lint to the extent that they would enroll and participate in a program that they more or less had in place, just adjusted for youth and the timing that youth could come and participate and work and potentially would it work as a pipeline? Would, it, would they find an opportunity to access a pipeline that they had not really tapped into before? The interesting thing about Lent too, is it's near the seacoast in New Hampshire and it's a relatively affluent area. So the, the story of the haves and have nots is, is pretty, severe in the sense that the gap in, in equity can be seen pretty significantly in that area of the state of New Hampshire. So I think the other thing that compelled them was the opportunity to give people, you know, a chance to to get, they, they knew they had the college relationship lined up, so it was an opportunity to get college credit um, and give individuals an opportunity to, to find employment and, and also do that, do that or, or line it up while they were in school. Um, so they they actually started to develop some materials and did some outreach. So they they went to CTEs. They got connected with um, Doug from Pinkerton Academy, uh, and they went out to several other schools and hosted informational sessions and handed out flyers and the like to get people interested. And then ran an interview process. So for essentially summer employment for juniors and seniors. They had almost a job fair like opportunity where they interacted, did some uh, interviews, some assessment and, and the like to gauge people's interest uh, and ultimately offered people opportunities or spots in the program where they were paid and enrolled in the apprenticeship. Uh, but they, you know, they had guidance counselors involved. Um, again, they'd already interacted and partnered with schools. So they knew what that, that uh, landscape looked like regarded, regarding you know, any potential dual enrollment opportunities. So um, Andrea, I, I think to kind of maybe answer part of your question, and we ran into this in Vermont as well um, with another employer partner. When you have, when they have a standing apprenticeship, registered apprenticeship program, that conversation about establishing a youth program becomes a lot more palatable. And it's then a discussion about again the structure of it the design of it that meets the needs of the employer but also meets the needs of a youth program um, and and we started the conversation because they the employer came to us and said look we're going to lose and i'm not kidding you 60 percent of their staff in certain roles within their organization within uh, i think it was a 10-year period so they knew they had 
absolute significant turnover and they didn't see a pipeline possible pipeline so we we then began the conversation have you considered a youth pipeline using your existing apprenticeship redesigning it slightly so that again it it, it could meet some of the needs of youth we were uh, we ultimately we ended up going after um, high, people transitioning after their junior year and or senior year and we ran the program two consecutive summers because we were limited on when those students were available to participate. Um, and then they came back and they worked um, after school, they worked through summer or winter vacations and so on to continue the OJT during the year. And then ultimately after that second year, they were hired full-time, not just part-time, but they were hired full-time um, and offered permanent employment. So, Again, I think it's much more palatable when the program exists um, and then it's just designing that program around what that particular pipeline need is and student accessibility. Right, and I, and I don't want to downplay the role again of the intermediary in that situation because much of that initial outreach and the plan that was leveraged to do it, the models they built, the materials that they developed were all in partnership with an intermediary, intermediary that, had, that had done that before. So they had the support to build the program, um, which I th again becomes an important component, at least initially with those builds, because or or those those components of outreach, because you know, it, having conversations with schools, uh, you know, my experience with Hypotherm, you know, we we stood right in the high school library, and and you know, between periods, they would bring potential. Candidates like enti the entire 11th grade would they'd split them up and they'd come and meet with us once they knew what this opportunity was and how valuable it potentially was. So everybody got exposure to it. We would talk about the program. One of the more impactful things that we used to do in those uh, situations is that we would have past graduates of the program talk about their experience and share and answer questions directly for students that were potentially interested. Mm -hmm. But getting also, engaged and getting the administration to support the schools to support that type of activity is 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 a superpower if you can do it. And and back to the first leaf in the the this continuum here, we absolutely included the parents in every step of the communication process, from communications from the school to um, kind of open house nights where where parents and students would uh, tour the facility. Um, to the information session when um, students were being enrolled, actually prior to enrollment, and then again when they were being enrolled, um, and then of course parents signed off on their um, on their registration forms. So it's is very much involving this, the parents every step of the way. Other potential questions, thoughts, experiences to share. Hi, Matt and Steve, this is Jake from CareerWise. Um, one of the benefits, obviously, you mentioned for registering is the ability to um, tie that apprenticeship to a certificate of completion that kind of certifies the apprentice as now, you know, qualified as a, a journey worker in that role. Have you, do you have examples in non-traditional fields of that being realized as like a tangible portable benefit and how and how do we communicate that better uh, or draw that connection better to make it uh, you know more of a tangible benefit beyond just you know the the accomplishment that goes into getting it yeah that that's a that's an that's a really good interesting question so I have one, Matt, if Go ahead, I, mean, I have a really good example, actually, Jake, we had um, a student in a machinist program one summer, actually two summers, and she applied to NASA to be, and I can't remember the exact, but a technician role at NASA. And the um, NASA offered her a, a role, but they wanted it contingent upon her completion of the apprenticeship program before they would actually bring her to Florida and hire her full time. So, for I think NASA saw the benefit from the receiving end, 
And I think that the apprentice saw it absolutely from the, the amount of effort and what she wanted to get out of her career and her parents saw it. I spoke to her parents directly about it and they were, you know, quite honestly, just absolutely thrilled that their daughter was able to, number one, land the apprenticeship program, number two, be provided the opportunity to fully complete it. And then number three, to see her aspire to kind of that end point where she knew she wanted all along, but she didn't know how to get there. She knew this was a step in that direction. Um, so anyway, I, absolutely, Jake. I mean, it, it's maybe not so obvious and it's also one of those kind of tough conversations to have when you're trying to first sell the, the uh, employer um you know with people having portability it's it's a tough conversation but we also worked with an employer who was very much um you know his philosophy was a rising tide tide raises all boats and he was going to invest in people locally in the um you know in the county area even at risk of losing them knowing that they would take their their um certificate with them. He was willing to take that risk and understanding that it would broaden the pool of candidates across the county. Yeah, and I I mean maybe not specific to your non-traditional role, but you know mm. interesting thing about the apprenticeship program at Hypotherm related to youth. So they could take the they took the apprenticeship program in the summer initially um, and they were guaranteed employment upon graduation. So we would essentially suspend their apprenticeship while they were not working and then reinstate it when they'd come back. Um, so the retention rate on those individuals is above 90%, uh, you know, and there's been approximately, you know, 30 over the course of time that have transitioned to hypotherm full time. But what's fascinating is there's only a handful of those individuals that are left running machines. Uh, the rest of them have all gone and taken their apprenticeship certificate and the degree program and taken roles all throughout the organization in IT, finance, corporate social responsibility. It's really a success story and an interesting um, thing to think about as it relates to it, it, apprenticeship certificates can not only act as uh, a credential in the sector that they got the skill set in, but it's also a credential that they build from and then take that wherever they want to go with it related to career changes and, and additional opportunities. Because I think the other thing that oftentimes happens with these programs is that once they recognize that they can accomplish something like achieving that certificate and, and gain a skill that they it opens their horizons up to, okay, well, I was able to do this what else can I do? Sort of what else is out there? Um, but I appreciate the question. It's terrific. Other thoughts or questions? Matt, I have another follow up question. Um, so I think one of the things that I'm really curious about as we talk about employer engagement is the distinction between kind of that initial employer engagement, employer management and employer retention, right? I think there's a distinction between those three things. It's not all just engagement, it's how we keep them at the table, right? How yeah. we make sure that we manage their relationship at the table. So I'm just curious if you can speak to that a little bit, like what are some of the ways you've had to either recalibrate with an employer about youth apprenticeship or you've had to um, kind of re-engage them throughout the process? Um, yeah, so that's, <laughs> I, I've got a couple on oh, this yeah. as well. Go ahead, Steve. Go okay. ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, no, no. Andrea, so what we took the approach, um, really with both employers that we started doing youth programs for, we took that, we, we made a conscious effort that we were going to take a lot of those responsibilities off of the employer's shoulders as an intermediary. So we did recruitment for them. We went in and spoke to schools. We uh, lined up um, guidance counselors, uh, tech, tech teachers. Um, we attended every single uh, event that they held, open houses. Um, we, you know, we were out in the parking lot, parking cars in, 
you know, position, you know, places that they weren't supposed to be parking in. You know, we, we really went to the nth degree to make sure that from an employer standpoint, we really did project manage it for them. So that was kind of the first and foremost, like it wasn't engagement, but it was that kind of retaining them, keeping them uh, fully committed and coming back each year because they knew it was simple. They knew that we, they were going to rely on us to be able to deliver that um, kind of hands on uh, approach. That was really right, but I, the keys. So what's interesting and what probably most people don't know on the call is that, so I worked, so I've been at IA for a short period of time in the grand scheme of things, but Steve and I have worked together for a lot of years. So Steve was my intermediary, intermediary support once upon a time when I was building these programs. Uh, but one of the things, right, because I'm sure the uh, next immediate question out of Andrea's mind is, well, how is that scalable or sustainable, right? Because that's amazing to be able to do that, but you can't do it for every employer and you can't do it forever. And what happened at Hypotherm is that I think the key is you have to stay engaged to the extent that the employer sees value, right? You start to see some of the outcomes and the benefits that we talked about at the beginning related to apprenticeship. And then eventually they understand the process, can start to own it. And that's ultimately what happened at Hypotherm is that we matured in apprenticeship to understand that these programs were important and we're able to take these things from IAA and integrate them into our business processes and, and, and leverage them as viable mechanisms to to fill pipeline needs. I, I mean, it's it's been 12 years, or I guess it's 13 at this point that Hypotherm has had an apprenticeship program, but there's been over 700 apprentices through that program, and it's their sole pipeline for machine operators at this point. The only way that they're still in New Hampshire manufacturing uh, world-class products is because of that apprenticeship program. Uh, and youth engagement plays a large you know, it makes an impact on that. Like the, there's opportunities for us to fill those roles and give people opportunities and experiences. Um, I think the other very important piece, Andrea, is that the, if the program isn't designed very specifically to the employer's needs, then the outcomes are not gonna be what the employer wants and they're not gonna come back to the table each year. That has to be like front and center when, when the design of the program is being established. It's what do they want for outcomes? What do they need? What are their pain points? And then the program has to be designed to, to meet that, to fill that need. And that's, I, that's how you keep them coming back. I think what's interesting too is I think in a year, maybe two, if we came come back and have this conversation, I feel like we're on the precipice of non-traditional apprenticeships starting to take off in the youth space. I feel like JFF is support, supporting some wonderful organizations and doing some really good work in the IT space and some of these other non-traditional spaces. And we're about to break through there because the need is at an all-time high for those roles, right? So you, you want something to get done, you have to create a sense of urgency. Well, through no means of any of ours, the urgency is there related to some of these roles and the evolution of technology. And they need people that can do the job more than they need people with the traditional credentials. And I feel like there's some wonderful organizations out there that we get to, we're fortunate enough to get to engage directly with some and then from a distance see the work that others are doing. But I feel like this momentum in this space is coming. And, and the good work that's been done in this organization Will hopefully have people well prepared for that. I think that's a really good, like Matt just dropped the mic. <laughs> it's a good right. place for us to end. <laughs> um, I want to thank um, Matt McKinney and Steve Lutton from IAA for joining us on this. Um, and on behalf of our project and JFF, thank everyone for joining on this. And I'll let Cassandra have the last word for Youth Apprenticeship Works. Thank you so much, Matt and Steve, for that great discussion. Um, and hopefully um, everyone um, is knowledgeable now, even more so, about the benefits of registering your youth apprenticeship program. And we would love for you to continue conversations with us um, about upcoming topics and basically to connect with us via our Youth Apprenticeship Works Community of Practice. And so if you have not received invitations from us about upcoming sessions, feel free to send me an email. If you want to participate in our community of practice and you need further information, please feel free to send me an email there. And so we would love to stay connect with, connected with you as you expand um, your youth apprenticeship efforts. And so I'll turn it back over to Andrea to close us out. 
That's it. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and happy National Apprenticeship Week. Um, please check out JFF's website and our LinkedIn page for any information around youth apprenticeship. And if you have not yet registered, please join us for the youth apprenticeship event happening tomorrow um, from 12 to 4 Eastern, the youth apprenticeship um, event. And I'm looking for the link right now, if I can just pull it up. Um, but if not, just go ahead and look on JFF's website and I look forward to seeing all of you there. Cheers. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Wonderful apprenticeship week. Thank you. Bye bye.